Welcome to Strength in the Numbers. My name is Andrew Codd, accountant, author, and commercial finance entrepreneur. And it's my job each week to bring you leaders in finance and business and deconstruct with them their real stories, insights, and hard-won lessons into practical advice on the key strengths and qualities you need to remain relevant in accounting and finance today, as well as the steps you can begin to take to elevate the impact you make to have a fun, successful, and rewarding career in accounting and finance. Now let's go over to the show. Hi everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Strength in the Numbers. Now, with all the talk of digital finance, a lot of traditional finance and some of the activities we've done in the past tend to get overlooked. So how much of your organization or even your client's finance activities are being either outsourced or offshored at the moment? Well, with barriers to knowledge transfer diminishing, outsourcing is moving more up market from those lower level transaction processing back office tasks into the higher value treasury, mergers and acquisitions, FP&A, just to name but a few. However, far from being a threat, these developments are also a great opportunity for finance professionals to add even more value to the bottom line of their businesses. So look, these are just some of the topics our guest mentor Jamie McBride and I cover on today's episode. And Jamie brings such great stories of what's going on in this space, some things I wasn't even aware of. And we have a bit of a giggle as well. And some of the things we actually go into a bit more depth are a practical tip that we can all do to improve our success in our finance transformation implementations. The importance of taking the time to engage and discover a bit more patience in ourselves and the type of value that will help us deliver. Also, the drivers behind finance offshoring and outsourcing, moving up market and we get in underneath those. And that's where there's perhaps some career opportunities for some of us. And also advice on how finance professionals can remain relevant in the face of the offshoring and its move up market. So look, hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please let your friends and colleagues know and check out the timestamped show notes at sitnshow.com slash podcast slash 080. There you'll find ways to connect with today's guest mentor, Jamie, but also some timestamped show notes to take you to the sections of the conversation most important to you. And also some of the key quotes that we've pulled out and also links to the resources that we mentioned on the show. So look, I really enjoyed this. I love Jamie's stories. He's such a great storyteller and these things are really happening. So look, it's jam-packed with value. Hope you enjoy it. So without further ado, over to Jamie and the show. Yeah, sure. Like um, look, like a lot of us after university, got a job in one of the, the big four. Back then it was the big five or six, um, big price waterhouse. Started off as an auditor, so started off with the green pen and, uh, and doing all the ticks. Um, and, the green pen. And then, yeah, the old green pen. I don't, don't know if they have them anymore. Um, uh, moved, on, moved on from the green pen and, and um, into risk management with Deloitte. Um, spent a number of years in there, moving into consulting um, around accounting and finance operations, uh, helping organisations and the CFO think about how they can improve and driving process transformation initiatives um, across the finance um, spectrum. Uh, from there, worked for a, a smaller consulting business, but um, out of the UK, although in their Australian office, um, again, doing accounting and finance uh, consulting. Um, until 10 years ago, we um, left that business, a few of us, and walked across the street to open a new business, um, two of them now, Optum2, a consulting business that helps CFOs think about how they can assess and improve their finance operating model, process and structure, and, and OptiBPO, which is a, where a bigger focus is these days, which is helping clients plan, build, and manage offshore teams in the Philippines with a big focus on building accounting and finance teams in the Philippines. There are two definite two areas I'd love to spend some more time talking about in a moment, Jamie, but I suppose in terms of your career, there's a lot of us on our journeys at the moment. Like in terms of that journey from practice into the more commercial world, you know, do any sort of particular moments stand out in your mind? There's there's a lot of moments that stand up. I guess one of them was um, realizing that um, auditing wasn't for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think a few of our audience could relate to that. So, um, so why was that? Uh, early, early on in my career, I, I often joked that I had to get promoted because I wasn't very good at the detail. 
Um, so they had to get me out of the detail by giving me a promotion. So I look, I, I think it was, I think it was um, that, that was that was an important part. Look, a lot of nearly all of my career since then has been focused on process and structure. Uh, and look, I think that's really where my strengths lies. Thinking about well, what's the right operating model? Um, how do we drive the, the improvement? Uh, and I guess that's where I've where I've seen uh, you know a lot of the excitement in my career is when you've been able to put forward recommendations and advice that organisations have implemented and executed um, that have seen them be successful. And and I suppose, look, some of our audience would would like to maybe understand how we can improve our chances of, of those implementations being successful. Would there be any sort of practical tips you could share with us, maybe a few steps perhaps, Jamie, to, uh, to allow us to be a bit more successful when it comes to those implementations? Yeah, look, look I, I think a really important part is, is making sure that we get a detailed understanding of the, the current state and engaging all of the right stakeholders on the way through. Uh, I was just speaking to a client today. We're helping them with their offshoring strategy, and part of that, and a key part of that is getting the, the, the processes right. Um, and he was saying to me, well, do we need it? He says, we kind of already know where we want to get to. He says, why don't we just start getting the kid? Yeah. Well, why don't we just start moving there? Yeah. Um, and I had to have the conversation with him to say, well, look, a big part of the, the, the process piece is I think all of us know intuitively that doing this as a profession, what good looks like. And we all know where we want to get to. Yeah. Uh, but it's bringing everyone else along on that journey with you. Um, and getting them to understand that as well. I often forget, and it's easy as a professional that consults on this on a day-to-day basis, that all of these things that are in my head on how things should work um, aren't necessarily in everyone else's head. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 it, it, it's understanding that that does take time. And look, I'm a uh, I'm a person that can be easily frustrated. And I can <laughs> I can be impatient, um, just just like everyone else. But it is making sure that you do spend that time um, to get the understanding of people's concerns. Yeah, because that's very important. I'm delighted you you mentioned that. In fact, I was just thinking about a conversation I was having early today, Jamie and myself, with someone that, you know, I find that impatience. And we all know, I mean, that's a great thing about being finance. We know how things should be connecting together and what the outcome should probably look like, particularly if we've done some financial uh, cost benefit analysis on it but yep. with that impatience sometimes we can come across as very condescending and not perhaps bring people with us on the journey i, I know i've done that i'll hold my hand up and, and it's sort of i'm, try, I'm a recovering yep. condescender type of thing or i'm trying to be more patient <laughs> but but um but like you, you got any sort of stories to, to share with us on that journey in terms of what worked well or, or what even didn't work well you know yeah, well, look, I was, I was called patronising just earlier today, so maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe I haven't, maybe I haven't, uh, maybe I haven't um, um, over, overcome it as uh, either as well. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I think that, and, and uh, you know, it, it, I think the, the important part, as I said, is just taking that time. Um, yeah, time. You know, and unfortunately, that's that's what adds to the effort. Um, clients will say to us, "Well, uh, why did a project over here take this long, and another project over here took a whole lot longer?" And it does come out of that engagement piece. For one, for one process improvement piece, the client had us engaged with 58 different people. I can tell you, after listening to 58 different people, um, numbers five to 58 all sound pretty much the same. You've heard the record. Um, you know what's on it, and you know what's coming up next. But if you look back on that organisation, they see it as a, a, a successful um, uh, improvement initiative because everyone was consulted on the way through. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a great example. I appreciate you sharing it. And uh, as much as it m- must have sound really repetitive, five to fifty eight, like everyone felt uh, felt that they were heard. And uh, we're human beings. At the end of the day, we deal with human beings, so that that makes complete sense. And sometimes we miss that when we're looking at the numbers. Yeah, abs- a- a- absolutely. So that uh, that was great. Thank you for sharing with that with us, Jamie. And I suppose in terms of at the moment, uh, what's exciting you most about your current work? Yeah, look, there's, there's probably a few things. But one of the key things for me is, you know, as I said earlier, the, the real big focus for us at the moment is helping organisations plan, build and manage offshore teams in the Philippines. Um, and one of the things that, that I'm realising, um, the more that I do this, um, is that knowledge truly is global. Um, the idea that there is borders, even though some leaders around the world would like to try to reinforce them, um, they can do that all they want. We can see that knowledge transfer is borderless and it's becoming easier and easier to do that. And we're seeing um, activities change that are getting outsourced and offshored. We're seeing them move up market. Um, you know, 10, 15 years ago when I started doing this, um, you'd be offshoring accounts payable. Um, we've just 
um, uh, hired a team uh, and, a, and a team leader who's going to be the global treasurer for a business um, wow. sitting in the, the offshore location. Um, we've got financial planning and analysis people um, sitting in the offshore location. I've got some M&A people. So realising that this knowledge is global and easily transferable and not while, while it's not accounting and finance directly related, I went to a client the other day. They're an industrial business. So I hit the buzzer on their gate and um, the lady introduced herself. Hi, it's such and such. Um, who are you? And I said, look, it's Jamie. I know who you are. Um, where are you sitting? And this, this client was sitting in Perth. The woman on the gate answering the gate was sitting in the Philippines oh, wow. uh, and, and, and then opened the gate for me. And, and, uh, and, and, and while that's just a small example, it just really is an example that the idea that geography is a constraint um, is getting reduced um, really, really rapidly. Uh, and, and look, that, 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 that excites me because I think it's a democratization yeah. um, you know, of knowledge and, and, and that, that sharing is fantastic. Uh, and that's only a positive for the whole world. Yeah, like you use the word uh, democratization. I think that's a much nicer word than I call it like vaporization. It's like um, <laughs> you know, all this technology is just allowing us to uh, to transfer knowledge much more easily, just putting it out there into the ether. And, you know, like uh, finance professionals, we could probably look at that in two ways. One, we, we could be terrified of it because it puts some of our traditional um, ownership of the knowledge and power base at risk. Or on the other hand, it allows us to get information out there faster, more easily and do something with it and connect more dots. So, um, and that's what really excites me about what you're doing, Jamie, is that particularly that it's it's not just your traditional compliance and transactional type roles. You know, you, when you use the word upmarket, I imagine that you're moving into the business partnering space, particularly if you're mentioning things like FP&A or M&A, quite yep. uh, commercially focused um, positions. You know, you know how, how did that come about? Or is that something clients want? I mean, how did you get into, into providing those type of services? Yeah, look, it, it, it is an evolution. One of the things that's interesting for me is that some of these areas that our that we go into with our clients are, are driven by them. Um, they've they've done the basics, you know. They've they've done the accounts payable, the receivable, the general accounting, the month end. They've got all of those outsourced in a global shared service supporting the, the supporting the world. They then said to us, "Well." You know, could we try such and such, or, or, or actually, or well, sometimes someone in their team has just shown a natural affinity um, to move into some of these other areas, so they've just started giving them the tasks. Um, and you know, we've we've had a lot of clients that go well, and, I, and once or twice with, with this global treasury analyst, I went never done that before, and they, I actually said to them, feel free to, I said, I said, feel free to try hire that same person um, onshore. We'll mm-hmm. try hire them as well in the offshore team, and, and we'll see who wins. Um, and you choose the best person for the job in the end. And, and this client, it was not a matter of cost. You know, a lot of offshoring is about cost. In, in this case, they were looking for the right person, um, not not the right cost base. Um, and we provided them with a range of candidates of which they were shocked at the capability of. And I, to be honest, I was kind of shocked as well when I read these resumes of people with some vast and deep experience um, that was exactly on, on on target for what this client wanted. Yeah, like that. That's one of the, th- the challenges I find, like as a finance leader, is you know there's always a focus on finance being a cost center and cost, and sometimes we are forced or challenged to look at offshoring. And by the way, like I'm, I'm a user of offshoring, and and I completely support it. Um, and but I wouldn't support it just from a cost perspective. You have to have the right people too, um, because ultimately it's about value creation. Now the thing is, I, I would lay down a challenge to a lot of finance professionals out there. There's many capable people around the world i mean it's no accident this podcast is being listened to like at the current count in over 120 countries because people want to learn out how to to add more value in finance create value for their companies so if you've got someone that can create almost equal value but one's got a different cost base then again with the focus being so much in finance on cost then then more than likely offshore becomes a real option However, when you think about that, there's so much value we can go create in our organizations with the strengths we have in finance, the access to decision makers, access to information, the financial training to translate activities into outcome, so, you know, and also that visibility across the business, particularly if we're more business partnering roles, you know, it does provide a very good platform to, um, to create and add value. So, so Jamie, I'm just wondering, have you got any stories you could perhaps share about some of the, the value that um, your services, particularly those like off-market roles are creating for your clients? 
Yeah, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to, yeah, I, I, will, I will make sure I answer that, but I'd like to reflect on one of your earlier, one of the earlier part of that conversation you were just having. We had a client that, that was that was truly against the idea of offshoring and outsourcing, um, and uh, she was, you know, I'd come into the office and I'd, I'd get the, the cold shoulder. Um, all of a sudden, I came in one day and she changed her attitude completely, wanted to have coffee with me, wanted to talk about how okay. we're going to do things. Uh, and I, I said to her, I, I did have to raise it with her. I said, look, what's changed? I, I realized yeah. I wasn't your best friend earlier. Uh, she said she kept, <laughs> she, kept, she, I said, she kept thinking about it and she spoke to her husband and then she said she came and he noted to her and she thought about it that this is a fantastic opportunity for her to really do something in terms of her career to put a mark on her resume to say, I have helped build this team that's done this. Um, and, you know, that looks fantastic. She said, rather than being the person that, that gets asked to move on because they wouldn't engage on something that was going to happen anyway. So there was this fantastic um, change in attitude with her and, and their team now that we've had with us for two years, um, and she's still part of the, the business and still one of our uh, key clients. Um, when I spoke to her recently, I said, well, you know, when you measure your offshore team, because uh, one of the criticisms, one of the things you'll hear is, well, the offshore team's not going to be as good. Um, and, and she said, if you graph the two of them from you know two or three years ago to now, then this team does purchasing and payments, so it's easily measurable. Um, she said, it's clear that the offshore team is performing at a level that the onshore team never did. Um, so not only are they they they, they cheaper, um, they're uh, lower cost based. Cheap is probably a poor choice of words. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're, they're doing a better job. Um, and they're, they're they're performing against all metrics, uh, so it's it's a it's a fairly strong business case and a great story for her to say. And they're a private equity owned business. We've saved eight hundred thousand dollars a year year on year, and I've driven the project to offshore it, and we've got better performance metrics than what we've ever had. So it's a it's a great story when it comes together like that, and it's a great example that she can show where she's demonstrated value to the bottom line. Um, and, and to to driving a better business outcome, but that's that's where that's where finance needs to go. It doesn't matter what organisation you're in. I mean, it's about creating value, helping create value for our businesses, and that means as much as sometimes we're viewed as a cost centre, we have to think profit or bottom line value, you know. And I think it comes out a lot in these conversations with our guest mentors that, you know, if if you look at the end of our days, you have to ask yourself the question: Is like, did we drive value today, or did we create value for our businesses? If we did then there's a sustainable job for, for us there. And actually, that's not a bad career you mentioned, is actually getting into um, offshoring and actually setting up these teams because that's another way of driving bottom line value uh, to the business. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, the guy I met at a barbecue, so not a, not a client, uh, <laughs> but he was telling me how, how through, um, he was a, a financial controller of a business, and he said that he was giving himself the objective to make himself redundant in a two-year period mm -hmm. uh, through building his outsourced team. Um, he was given uh, an incentive to do that, uh, and he was saying it was one of the. He said it sounds strange when your your job is to do yourself out of a job, uh, but he said it was a fairly re rewarding project. He says over a two-year period to uh, build the outsourced team, transition there all of that activity. Um, then he kept building up the team. Then he actually even hired his own replacement, <laughs> uh, uh, which he then handed over to at the right point. They all agreed and he moved on and sailed off into the sunset um, and, and, and found another role. And, and, and he, he said to me, he said, uh, I said, well, uh, um, he said, that, he says, you're a pretty wanted person. He says, when you've been able to demonstrate, you can do that in your career. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, because because it's a, a no-brainer. You're going to more than likely have dollar amount savings to the bottom line. And if you're dealing with, you know, specialists in this space, you're probably going to improve the outcomes as well or benchmark that you're comparing against. So it's it's actually quite a, a probably could be a good lucrative career to get into. You may not be with a company for a long period of time, but I imagine there's plenty of companies out there looking at this space. I'm thinking probably medium sized organizations as opposed to large ones because um the medium ones may not necessarily have the scale scale economies to, to do it for many full time people, but there may be opportunities to at least um, off, offshore or take on some of their um, activities or common activities across uh, multiple companies. So, so do you find your clients are a particular size, Jamie, or where's sort of the demand for these types of services? Yeah, look, that's that's a really good um, uh, lead-in. Um, 
typically our clients are that middle market. Look, and everyone defines the middle market differently. Um, we define it as between 50 and around 500 people. Of, of course, we have clients that are bigger than that, and we have some that are smaller than that. Everyone everyone does. But but that that, that middle market is is interesting for me in that the, the bigger end of town will have a, you know, a CFO that's sometimes even removed from the accounting function and the transactional pieces. But you know, a 500 person company turning over a you know, a, a billion revenue or something around that around that mark will often have a single senior uh, a CFO, an FP&A person, maybe a commercial manager, um, and there may be a team of twenty or thirty in the accounting function. Um, so, so those sort of functions are the ones that that they're not going to have expertise internally to run these sort of projects. Um, bigger companies will, or they may. Um, so they're they're at a size where. They're never going to have someone on their books that's going to be doing this, um, but they will have someone that can come in and help them do it. And, and we see that's where the big opportunity is for us. The big end of town sorts these things out themselves internally. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the middle part of town needs to have that advice, and, and that's kind of the service that we provide. Yeah, and, and I suppose, you know, for, for those in the existing positions in those sort of middle market companies, like... Is there, is there any advice you could maybe share with those finance professionals in terms of how they can remain relevant and and continue to add value to their organisations? Yeah, look, I I think it's uh, it's a it's a willingness to understand that things are going to change regardless. Um, you know, we always get told that automation is going to kill outsourcing. I disagree completely. Um, but um, for me, I just think it changes the nature of the outsourcing because people are still going to be needed in terms of what they do. There's always things coming along, be it automation, be it outsourcing, that is reducing um, those lower level transactional roles, further automating them. Um, and, and there's a need then for finance people to continuously reskill themselves, to continuously really change what it is that they're, they're looking to achieve. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's an important part of being open to it. Uh, just like this lady or that client who at first was against it, kind of realized there's not a, there's not a big future in being against some of these initiatives for you. Yeah. Um, you've kind of got to get on the, get on the bus, um, build up your knowledge around it, understand what works and doesn't work because if your organization is going to embark on this strategy and you can put your hand up and say, well, I know a fair bit about this, um, you're going to be a valuable person in that business to help them be successful. Exactly. And I, I like the way you sort of asked the two questions there, but like what doesn't work? I think that's that's a really good area where it can be complemented by existing accounting and finance uh, professionals to, to extract even more value from the whole process. So I think that's really important too, is that um, there is opportunity even where people may be, be fearful of it. And this change or nature of change isn't going away. It's here to stay. And if anything, it's going to become more and more. Which uh, which is sort of lead me on to the future, I guess, a bit, Jamie. So, like, what are be your your sort of priorities for the next say twelve months? Yeah, look, one of the interesting things for me, um, if you can't tell by my accent, I'm I'm from Australia and I'm based here in Australia. Um, we have we have <laughs> we have offices in London, which um, have Australians and Germans and a few others. We don't have that many British people actually in our London office. <laughs> uh, and and we, and we have a US business as well. One of the interesting things for me is that even though, and I was in America three weeks ago speaking to clients, that even though the US invented offshoring um, at the big end of town. Uh, once you step below that, it's 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 a it's a concept that is foreign to them in many regards. Uh, I met with uh, 10, 15 clients um, three weeks ago on potential clients, and they were sitting there saying, "Really, people are doing this? You can do this in a middle-sized business?" Um, and and so the US is still really really focused on the why. Um, and it really, is can we do this? Is this a strategy? We find the UK is a little bit ahead. Um, you know, where they're starting to ask more, okay, well, this is great, but how do we do it? Whereas Australia, for some reason, I'm not being parochial or saying this because I'm Australian. <laughs> uh, I, 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 think, I think as Australia, we're, we're, in, we're in a small island of 25 million people where we've, and we're close to Asia and we've really had no choice um, but to think about this. Um, so I think every, uh, every second middle, every business that we've met is either thinking about it, talking about it. And so they want to understand the how and they want to understand why are we better than the other people they've been speaking to on the way through. So for me, over the next 12 months, it's, it, it's helping um, build up some of that knowledge. Uh, and I said, yeah, the US is a, is, is a bit of a strange one in that regard on some of these things, even around automation, you know, they, Often you'll go to a client and they'll still have a check signing machine. And again, nothing, not having a go here at the US, 
but there's, 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 each 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 place is a, a different level of its of maturity. Course. So, so so we see the opportunity um, in in helping drive this forward as an initiative and as a as a firm um, in those other parts of the world. I oh, no, appreciate you opening up about that, Jamie, and and sharing those uh, those thoughts with us. Uh, got a few rapid fire questions for you for you now. Um, I suppose in okay. terms of in terms of advice, you know, what's been the best bit of advice you've ever received, whether it be work or personal advice? Yeah, so I, I, it's always funny. You, you rack your brain trying to remember who told you these things. <laughs> I, 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 I can't I can't for the, I can't for the life of me. But uh, but but one of the things I was told earlier on, it's always stuck with me, is that if you have a business mission statement or a personal mission statement that no one would ever argue against, it's a poor it's a poor mission statement. Yeah, for example, um, we aim to be the best at X, um, and this person said, well, no one's going to argue against that. No one's ever going to say, well, you shouldn't be the best at X. He mm. uh, says so you, you need to make sure you put forward a, a mission statement that people might dislike, or they might challenge, or they might ask questions about. Um, because then you've got the right one. If you've got the answers to the challenges and the questions, and it's not just a motherhood statement, then you've really thought it through. Mm, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that's uh, so. Is it like something you're constantly developing then, or is that something like how how does that work in practice? Yeah, look, oh, we always think about it in terms of our own business and our, and our proposition that you know mm-hmm. um, we 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 spend a fair bit of time on on our words. Um, we always say pl- that what we do, we help clients plan, build, and manage offshore teams. We've thought about each of those words and words and what plan means and what manage means and what build means, mm-hmm. um, and and yeah, that's something we're always challenging ourselves to, to to think about. And so and then people can come back and say, well, what do you mean by plan? What do you mean by manage? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think this person was right that often you'll see people describe what they do or what they want to be, and it's to be the best provider of such and such in a region, or it's to be uh, you know, all of those sort of things again, which which really don't set you apart. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's a re- really interesting thought. Never really thought about it like that. And of course, you've you've chosen verbs as well, so they're actually with an action to do something. So I like I, li- I like that, and I like the fact that um, you know you've already got a view. I mean, I I like the fact that it potentially opens up conversations, and conversations leads opportunities. So um, they're value creating in themselves. So yeah, that's all yeah, like that. absolutely. So I like, like that, and I suppose Jamie, if there was maybe a book you've come across in your travels a resource you'd recommend our audience uh, what might that be yeah I've, I've always been a very very poor reader of business books uh, for, for, for whatever for whatever reason I often get through the first chapter and um, that's about as far as that's about as far as I get that's about as far as I as far as I get because you realize you realize the next 300 pages um, repeats the, the first 30 pages but one book I, I I've always loved and I even bought it for a range of different people and I think people got sick of getting it as a present was um, uh, Ricardo Semler's uh, Maverick mm-hmm. um, and and if you haven't read the book uh, he talks about his open management style um, you know and and things you know and and, uh, and sharing all the financial information of the business with his staff which I've always thought is a fantastic idea yeah. and in the book he even talks he starts distributing the P&L to everyone um, and then some people in the organisation said, "Well, that's lovely, but we don't know how to read the PNL." So then they ran courses on how to read the PNL. Um, then they put everyone's salary up on the wall, um, and then team members actually got to assess and improve their own uh, assess and agree their boss's salary. Uh, you know, so with with the interesting, the interesting point being that a lot of the time um, they would come back with the right salary, and all that. I mean, all of that those issues around, well, my boss earns too much, and this and that. Um, started to dissipate. I don't know how true the whole book is. I'm going to, I'm going to hopefully, hopefully it is. But I, I always just thought that openness to present finances and put them on the table is 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 really critical. And we try to do it in our business. People will often say, "Well, you know, but you're making a whole bunch of money here." And, you, and, and when you lay the costs out in front of them, and you show it to them. Um, people actually start to realise. Um, that the, the, the maybe there isn't a whole bunch of smoke and mirrors and maybe what you're saying is right. And they also start to think more for themselves in terms of how they can improve things. So so I think the, the great thing about that book was the, the level of transparency, which I think is critical. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, I mean, people use that as a buzzword nowadays, transparency, but I think there's a mindset behind it. And the way you described that, Jamie, that seems to be encapsulated from the book. So uh, I appreciate you recommending that resource to us. Uh, and I suppose in terms of our audience, if um, they want to know more about you or, or connect with you, where's the best place to find you at? Yeah, look, probably the best place is to uh, go to our website, which is uh, www.opti, so O-P-T-I, uh, B-P-O, so opti, B-P-O, 
dot uh, com, and there's a contact form on there that you can fill in, which will which will come through to me, um, or you can shoot me an email at uh, Jamie J A M I E dot McBrien M C B R I E N at opti bpo dot com. So again, O P T I B P O dot com. Oh, thank you, Jamie. And look, I'll I'll put those resources and those contact information into the show notes. And uh, look, in terms of in terms of this show, I, I really appreciate you making the time uh, to come on and share your stories, your journey, also some of the breaking out the practical steps around the implementation and some of the things that could go well and not so well, and you know, painting a picture of what the future of finance might look like, or it actually is looking like now, and what the next twelve months might look like as well. So, Jamie, thanks for coming on the show and being a great guest today. Excellent, Andrew. Thank you for having me. So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to know more about our guests today, their bio, and follow up on the resources mentioned during the show, you can find all the relevant links and more at sitnshow.com. There you'll also be able to get access to earlier shows, read the latest blogs. There's also an opportunity to subscribe to our newsletter, which will give you heads up as to when the next show is coming out, latest events, news, and anything that's going to be relevant to help you have a fun, rewarding, and successful career in finance and accounting. And just before you go, we really appreciate your feedback. If there's something we can do better on the show, something that's not working, or something you'd like to see, even a guest you'd like for us to invite onto the show, someone who you think might be able to benefit you more and also the rest of our community, please let me know. You can email me. I'm at andrew at sitnshow.com or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just drop me a message so I know how you found me and we can connect. And really, it's our community that will make the show. If we keep engaging and driving each other on, we'll keep on building our strength in the numbers. And when all is said and done, if we can do the numbers better and finance better, we'll create more opportunities for ourselves, our friends, our families, our communities and our businesses. So until next time, have a good rest of the week. Take care and let's keep building our strength in the numbers.